Hey, everyone. Hope you're enjoying Nodes so far. Um, if you didn't know, this week is International Geography Awareness Week. And today specifically is GIS Day, which is Geographic Information Systems. Um, so this is an appropriate topic to dig into on GIS Day. Uh, we're going to be talking about working with geospatial data in near for Jane. So my name's Will. I work on the developer relations team at Neo4j. So largely my job is to help developers build applications with graphs and Neo4j. When I should mention uh, the these slides are available, dev.neo4j.com slash geo notes 2022, or you can snap a picture of that QR code. I have my uh, Twitter handle up there in my website where I publish a blog. That's probably the, the best way to get in touch with me these days. So when I first started learning about GIS, one thing really stood out to me when I learned about uh, what's called Tobler's first law of geography. And this is that everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. And this really resonated with me because really this is sort of graph thinking uh, as sort of the foundation of geography and GIS. So let's look at an example. So I was recently in Minneapolis um, for a trip. So if we were to apply this framework, we could say that San Mateo, San Mateo is where uh, New York J headquarters is. So San Mateo is more similar to Santa Cruz, San Francisco, and San Jose than it is to Minneapolis. I mean, Minneapolis is you know, like, I don't know, over a thousand miles from San Mateo. Uh, and we can, we can quantify this similarity using physical distance. So for example, yeah, it was close, 1,500 uh, miles from San Mateo to, to Minneapolis, um, while the other cities are, are much closer together. So that's one way to represent these relationships. But Topler was really talking about not just physical distance, but also things like uh, human geography, right? So I could say these cities maybe are culturally more similar than Minneapolis. Um, anyway, however we want to represent that, it is talking about geography as a graph. So this really stuck with me um, because graph data structures are really fundamental to working with GIS. So a graph fundamentally is this data structure. Nodes are the entities, relationships, connect nodes. And in order to work with data in a graph, we add properties. So we can store properties in arbitrary key value pairs on nodes and relationships. We add labels as a way to group nodes. Every relationship has a single type. This is the property graph data model. Now, once we have an instance of a property graph, then this becomes a knowledge graph. So a, a knowledge graph is talked about in lots of different ways, but the way I think of a knowledge graph is really just an instance of a property graph. So I have some data modeled with the property graph model that puts things in context. And things is, is an important concept here, even though it sounds simple, but once something is a thing, that means that I have a canonical representation of it in the graph. So this example, this is data from uh, New York Times articles. Uh, New York Times has an API. So we've loaded some data about articles, about people mentioned in the articles, the geo region. So I have a canonical representation of these things now. So um, when I have a new article about US politics and government, I know that I need to attach that to the US politics and government topic node. And that helps me uh, contextualize the data that I'm working with. So this data, like I said, comes from the New York Times API. I have a little service set up to fetch the most popular articles every day and load that into a near 4 j Aura database. Um, so we'll take a look at that in a minute here. But once we have that data in near 4 j there are a few ways that we can analyze it, that we can work with it to build applications. I, I think this is kind of a spectrum between our graph local operations and our graph global operations, where local traversals are I'm traversing the graph from a well-known starting point to answer questions like, what, what are the uh, news in my area today? Uh, to things like, let's analyze the most influential people mentioned in the news. That's going to be something like PageRank with a graph global operation. And 
we'll see today how everything along the spectrum uh, can be relevant for working with geospatial data. But first, let's back up and talk about some of the functionality in Cypher for working with spatial data. So Cypher supports a 2D or 3D point type with either a geographic or Cartesian coordinate reference system. Uh, so when we say geographic coordinate reference system, we're talking about latitude and longitude. Uh, and with the Cartesian coordinate reference system, that's sort of a bring your own domain. So if we're working with geospatial data, we're probably going to want to use the geographic uh, points. If we're working with uh, something on an XY or XYZ plane that doesn't necessarily map to the location on the surface of the Earth, um, I've seen examples of things like modeling a manufacturing process or modeling some sort of in-game VR type scenario. Uh, that might be a good case for working in uh, the Cartesian uh, CRS. So the units for latitude and longitude, these are decimal degrees. The units in Cartesian, well, they're whatever I want them to be, whatever the domain I'm working with is. Because we're talking about geospatial data today, uh, mostly we're going to limit ourselves to looking at uh, 2D geographic points. So here's just an example in Cypher. I can use this point function to create a point instant. And once I've created that instance of a point, I can store it as a property on nodes, on relationships. So here I've created a point of interest node uh, to represent uh, some bakery somewhere. I think this is actually somewhere in Germany. Uh, and set the location property to this point value. Once I have points, uh, there are a few other sort of base spatial functions in Cypher that are relevant here. So uh, point dot distance, which will uh, compute the distance between two points. Point dot within B box. This is useful for searching within a bounding box, so searching within a rectangle uh, to find other points. Uh, and then the point function, which, which we've already seen for creating a point instance. So here we are searching for point of interest nodes where the distance between the location property on our point of interest node and some arbitrary point uh, that we've defined is less than 200 meters. Uh, and I find a couple of bakeries and a kindergarten. OK, so let's go back now to our uh, New York Times news graph data. So we have data about articles. We know the topics of the articles, if they mention an organization, a geo region, uh, and so on. And I should mention, when we fetch this data from the New York Times API, it does pull out uh, geo regions, but it doesn't give us latitude and longitude. We'll just get something like London or the White House, Washington, DC, or something like that. Uh, and so what we can do is geocode those location descriptions uh, and turn that into latitude and longitude so we can create points uh, so we actually know where these geo regions are physically. Um, that's the, the process of geocoding. Geocoding is available in APOC. If you're familiar with APOC, APOC is kind of the standard library for Neo4j, adds lots of additional functionality to Cypher. So there's an APOC spatial geocode function um, that will, by default, I think it uses the nominatum OpenStreetMap geocoding geo service, so kind of low bandwidth, but we can also configure it to use um, Google's geocoding service, which is um, what I typically use. But anyway, you can see we give it some sort of description of a location, uh, and then we get back a latitude, la longitude, and description of this. And this is exactly what I use in the little service I have set up to pull in this uh, New York Times data. Um, you can see here. Uh, well, actually, let's just look at the, the code. This is on GitHub. So this is a, a GitHub action 
that I use to basically set a cron job to, I think once a day it runs, um, there's a GitHub action called flat, which allows us to basically go out to uh, a JSON endpoint or run a database query and then work with that data. I wrote a little extension to that called flat graph, which allows us to just define uh, a cipher query for how we want that data to be added to Neo4j and it points at a, a Neo4j Aura instance. Um, and then after it fetches the data from the New York Times API, I just run this query. So any geo regions that don't have a location, we try to geocode them and then we set the location to uh, the result of that geocoding process. Okay, so once we have that, we can then write queries that say things like, show me the news for the day closest to me. So this query, this is saying find uh, geo regions where the location is less than 200 kilometers from uh, this point. This is somewhere in Montana. So we have to go out uh, quite a bit before we find things within uh, 200 kilometers. Uh, and we can find uh, some examples. So here's an article about this famous Chinese food restaurant in Butte. Um, we have some other articles about things that happen in Cascade County, which is a county in, in Montana. We can see the topics of those. So we can traverse the graph once we have the starting point of our geo region. We can also do some simple pathfinding operations. So pathfinding um, doesn't necessarily need to be specific to geospatial data. Here we're finding the shortest path through the graph connecting the Federal Aviation Administration to the National Park Service. And it turns out there uh, was an article written about each that both are connected to this topic, national parks, monuments, and sea. So it ends up being a fairly short path. Now, Neo4j is a database, which means that I often want to be able to work with Neo4j and other tooling to accomplish whatever task I'm, I'm trying to do. Uh, and it's really important that these integrations uh, and this tooling work together. So let's say that I want to create a map that is showing areas mentioned in the news. Um, here's, here's a map that, that does that. We, we've put a, a dot everywhere um, that has a geo area mentioned in a news article in uh, the New York Times. We could Im improve that a little bit. One, one thing we could do to improve it would be to uh, make those dots proportionally sized to the importance or the relevance, or maybe how many articles are written about that geo region. That would be a good place to start. Maybe run page rank, um, something like that, some centrality measure. Um, and this map, uh, this is a screenshot from QGIS or QGIS. Let's take a look at uh, how we created this. So here's QGIS. QGIS, um, if you're not familiar, is like a desktop GIS tool. Um, so we can use it to analyze GIS and uh, spatial data. And let's see how we can create this sort of map where we are showing uh, all the regions where some news has been mentioned and we wanna draw that proportionally to the centrality of that geo region. Uh, so starting off, we have a, a lovely Robinson projection of the world, which allows us to see the world in one view and then some natural earth shaded relief. And then down here we have the Python console. So we can use Python to interact with, uh, with QGIS and that's exactly what we're gonna do. So. Um, I have a Neo4j instance, news.graph.zone. This is a read-only user, um, so it's fine that we're sharing our credentials in this case. You can log into this database and, and query the news if you like. Then we're creating a new uh, vector layer in QGIS. We're doing some uh, setup for proportional symbol size to render our symbols. And then here's our cipher query. So we're matching um, all geo regions, and then we're calculating uh, just centrality uh, degree centrality of that geo region. So basically, just how many articles uh, were written about that geo region. And then uh, we have some functions here for once we run the query, how do we create a point and add it to our layer in QGIS? So we'll give that a run. Let's zoom in a little bit. So we can see, okay, we have a bunch of dots that represent different places that are mentioned 
in the news. Uh, areas that have more news articles are slightly larger. Uh, we have that proportional symbology there uh, that's useful. So now let's look at relationships between these geo regions. Um, so I'm going to run another Python script. And we're doing something similar. We're, we're setting up some proportional uh, symbology. But now here's our Cypher query. We're going to look at uh, geo co-occurrence. So for a given article, what geo regions are mentioned together frequently? We're going to uh, calculate that for each pair of geo regions. And then we're going to draw a line connecting these pairs of geo regions to see what regions are mentioned uh, together. And we're going to make the thickness of that line proportional to the number of uh, sort of overlapping uh, articles. So we can see some strength in the relationship uh, between these geo regions. Um, OK, so that was a, a quick look at how we can pull data into QGIS and analyze it using uh, the Python API for QGIS. Uh, I've been looking at building a QGIS plugin for Neo4j. Um, so far, there, there's not much code there, um, but you can find the, the Python scripts that we just ran uh, on this GitHub repo um, also. If you think that would be something useful, drop a, drop a note in the issues or something, and we, we'll um, see how that progresses. OK, so let's talk about spatial search with Neo4j. So, we, we know we can traverse the graph using Cypher and Neo4j to answer questions like, show me, I don't know, Irish pubs near me that are open now that my friend uh, has reviewed positively. That's also around the corner from uh, an Italian restaurant that serves tiramisu because I like tiramisu for dessert, right? We can, we can write those kinds of queries in Cypher. But the spatial search component is kind of the starting point for those types of queries. So I want to find something near me. I want to find something in this certain neighborhood, uh, and so on. So spatial search is important in this case for finding sort of the starting point uh, for some of those traversals. So we're going to look at three types of spatial, spatial search with Neo4j. Uh, we're going to look at radius distance search. So that's basically find things near me within some radius distance of a point. Uh, find something within a bounding box, within a rectangle. Uh, and then the third one we'll look at is a uh, point in polygon. So this is useful often for, I don't know, maybe like finding something in a neighborhood where the boundaries of a neighborhood or a census district or something like that. Uh, and uh, you can find the code uh, in this GitHub repo that's linked down here. So I wanted to use some real world data and, and a, a more sizable data set than just a few thousand uh, geo regions that are mentioned in the New York Times articles. So I wanted to pull in some data from OpenStreetMap. Uh, OpenStreetMap is super useful. It's crowdsourced data um, throughout the world. There's amazing amounts uh, of data in OpenStreetMap. But it can be sometimes a little bit difficult to work with. There isn't a uh, sort of schema or, or standard structure imposed on some of the tags, for example, that are uploaded. Um, so I like to use the daylight distribution of OpenStreetMap, uh, and specifically the daylight Earth table. This is a, a distribution that's uh, uh, cleaned up and then published by Facebook. And they impose a sort of three-tier ontology for uh, OpenStreetMap this way. So theme, uh, class, and subclass is, is how they define it. So we can search for things like buildings, land, points of interest. Uh, and points of interest is what I chose to start with here. And within point of interest, we have things like amenities. Uh, and then the narrowest level, we have things like uh, a bench. So I know that this, um, this point has a bench. Um, the daylight earth table is available on S3 in uh, Parquet files. So we'll take a look at this Python notebook that I use to import this data. So here's the data model that I came up with here. So we store the uh, point geometry. And in this case, the geometry is just a point. We'll talk about working with lines and polygons in a second. Um, and then 
we have the point of interest node uh, connected to the geometry node. And I chose to save the class and subclass or the category and subcategory as node labels. Um, we could do those as properties. I'm not in love with that model. Um, and then we also have all of the arbitrary key value tags that uh, are also available. I chose to model those on uh, a separate node. So to load this data, uh, I use pandas. So pandas can read uh, parquet files directly from S3, and then we get a data frame to work with. Uh, and then I did a little bit of, of cleanup. I, I filtered out any points that didn't have a name. Um, I grabbed the local name, and then we convert the uh, WKT, uh, which is well-known text, which is a way of representing geometries. Uh, in this case, uh, converted that to just a array of latitude, longitude pairs to make that easier to work with. Uh, and we ended up with, uh, so we started with 30, let's see, will this tell me here? Yeah, we started out with 38 million rows, and then I think we ended up with somewhere around 16 or 18 million after filtering out uh, any that weren't named. Then to load these into Near4j, uh, we wrote a little wrapper around uh, the Near4j Python driver. And then it's important to be able to handle these in batches. I don't want to just send 18 million rows uh, to try to write to Near4j all in one transaction without trying to batch these. So we batched them. Uh, I did it in batches of 10,000 rows. We could probably up that to at least 100,000. Um, this just took a few minutes to, to load on my laptop. Then what we do is use the unwind functionality in Cypher to be able to iterate over each row in uh, the data frame that we end up uh, passing. And then we can just use Cypher to define how we want to create that data in the graph. OK, so the next thing we did uh, once we've loaded this data is to create a point index. Uh, so earlier today, Stu was talking about the new indexing functionality in Neo4j 5. So the, the create point index, that's new, uh, new syntax, new functionality for new indexes that are available in Neo4j 5. The point index is one of those. Um, so specifically, it uses a Hilbert space filling curve over a generalized B plus tree. You can read more about um, the index and, and what that means in that link there. Uh, but the nice thing about this is we don't have to understand how that uh, how the index works to be able to take advantage of it. Uh, it, it takes just a, a couple of minutes to populate the index. So you can, uh, when you create the index, you can either uh, have that block while the index is being populated or just kind of check back. If you run colon schema in the FJ browser, you can see the status of your indexes. OK, so why are indexes important? Well, um, we have what, like 18 million or so points of interest, which is it's not an, an enormous data set, but it, it'll make a, a sizable difference as we're searching things. So on the left is the same query without using an index, where we end up doing a label scan. Uh, and we end up spending uh, just under four seconds to find our points of interest versus on the right, we do uh, a node index seek, which is much faster. Um, that results in just 200 database hits in uh, anywhere between one and three milliseconds it seems to take on my machine. You'll notice it still does a filter after the index lookup. And that's because the index gives us basically uh, points within a bounding box. And then we need to do a filter to filter the sort of circular radius since we're doing a radius search here. OK, and I wrote a little demo app. Let's see if this will work um, to try to showcase um, how this works. So this is a, a leaflet map, just a simple web map. I've pulled in um, a leaflet plugin that allows to draw on the map and then the Neo4j JavaScript driver. And so there's a few different ways we can search here. So one is I can draw a circle. So we'll go up here to Millbrae near the airport, and we'll search for points of interest. OK, here's some, some points of interest near the airport. Uh, and the way this works, so here 
in our uh, event listener section in our JavaScript code. It's the case where we drew a circle. Uh, we grab the radius and the center point of the circle. And then our Cypher query is looking for points where uh, the distance from the center of the radius uh, is less than uh, whatever the radius is that we drew. And then uh, when we get those results, we just create a marker and, and add those to the map. Uh, and you can see that's that's pretty fast. And we're again, we're searching a database on my machine with uh, 18 million or so points of interest. So we could do this anywhere in the world, but let's just go down now to Burlingame. And this is now the bounding box. And so in the case where we drew a rectangle, we're going to do this point dot within B box query. Uh, and in this case, we pass the coordinate for the lower left. So this one here, and then the uh, other argument is the upper right, and that defines uh, the bounding box. And then we get back uh, all the points, and then we search for um, additional information like the tags, the name, uh, and so on. OK, and the final one that we're going to do here is polygon, so point and polygon. So this is useful. You see this a lot on real estate sites. If I want to search within a certain neighborhood, maybe I want to be within I have no idea what this neighborhood is in, in San Mateo, somewhere between Foster City and, and San Mateo. Um, now we can see here are the points just within that polygon. And point and polygon ends up being a, a little bit more complex. Uh, what we do is when we get the polygon geometry, the first thing we do is uh, convert that to a bounding box. Then we can do a within bounding box query in the F4J, which will use the index. Uh, and then once we have that, then we filter on the client to remove any points that are within the bounding box, but not within the polygon. Uh, and the reason we do that is we want to be able to take advantage of the index in the database for that really fast uh, search. OK, and these are just some screenshots uh, of what we just saw in uh, the demo app. Cool, so so far we've been talking about point geometries. Um, how do we work with things like lines and polygons? Well, one way to do that is to store arrays of points as properties on nodes or relationships. So here's an example. I uh, exported all my data from Strava and added that uh, into the graph. Uh, and here you can see I'm storing the uh, point in an array called coordinates uh, on the node. Uh, and we can do line search very similarly. So let's do a radius distance in San Mateo. And we can see here, uh, we find just one. So this was a, I know, a jog or something that I went on out to Coyote Point uh, and back. And the way this works, uh, if we take a look at the code, here's the Cypher query. We use the any list predicate to find uh, where any of the points in this coordinates array are within the radius distance that we're searching for. And we can see several of them are, even though the entire line uh, is not. So that's how we can work with line geometries. Um, let's talk about routing next. So we were talking about this idea of um, graph algorithms. Uh, if you're familiar with the graph data science library, this is a plugin for Neo4j that adds lots of additional functionality. Um, you can see some some of the algorithms that are supported. But pathfinding is one class of algorithms that are available in the Graph Data Science plugin. Um, so these are algorithms like uh, A star or Dijkstra, breadth first search, depth first search, these sorts of things. So for this one, we're going to use uh, a data set that is available on Neo4j Sandbox. Uh, if you look for, I think it's just called the Graph Data Science use case. You can find this in New York J Sandbox. And we have uh, data about airports and uh, airports that have flight routes between them and where, where in the world uh, airports are located, uh, this sort of thing. 
So to do um, any sort of graph algorithm stuff with uh, the graph data science library, the first thing we need to do is create a projected graph. So oftentimes the algorithms that we're running, uh, we're not actually interested in running on either the data that we actually have stored in the database. Maybe we want to infer some graph from what we've stored in the database, uh, or maybe we're interested in just a, a subgraph. But either way, we need to project that graph from the database into memory so we can run these algorithms. And in this case, we're interested in a weighted relationship uh, where distance is the weight, so distance between two airports. Uh, and let's take a look at this example. So here are, these are not all the airports of the world. I, I filtered for, uh, I think, airports that have at least two runways or something like that. They're, the marker size is a little, a little busy um, in this case. Uh, so let's say we want to go from uh, Punta Arenas in Patagonia to Honolulu. Here's the shortest route by distance is to fly to Santiago. I think we actually have a stop in Easter Island here. And then we fly to Tahiti and then up to Honolulu. So this is using Dijkstra's algorithm, which is uh, a weighted shortest path, similar to A star. Um, with A star, though, we have uh, a function that's telling us how close we are. Um, of course, this is a, a fairly simple airport routing uh, logic. We can do uh, lots of other things to factor in as well, like uh, cost and time, connections, these sorts of things. OK, um, so I have just a couple minutes left, and I, I have one more example that I want to talk about um, to showcase one of what I think is the most powerful features of graph databases like Neo4j, and that's the ability to combine data sets and query across them. Uh, and so for this one, I was looking at a database of protected areas in the US. So the, the US Geological Survey publishes this protected areas database. And these can be things like national parks, wildlife refuge, um, these sorts of things. Uh, and then I wanted to take a look at US Congress to see, well, how are these protected areas being legislated? Are there bills in Congress that are uh, doing things like maybe trying to um, change the size, address the funding of, of, of some of these, kind of what's going in in Congress related to these protected parcels. Um, and so uh, to do this, I use the, the ProPublica API. Um, once I've loaded in the, the parcels, uh, and I'll look, look just briefly at how we load the parcels. Um, so the... Protected Areas Database, this comes in the format, I, I think, of a bunch of shapefiles, perhaps. Um, but I use the uh, GDAL command line tool to convert, to reproject and convert these to GeoJSON. And then we can use the APOC load JSON functionality to load these GeoJSON files. Um, and the thing I want to talk about here, though, is these are polygon geometries, right? So a, a national park, a protected area is some, uh, some polygon geometry. And to represent that in the database, uh, I store these again as a array of points to, repre the, to represent that uh, polygon geometry. So once we have that, um, we can do things like in near j Bloom, uh, oh, we disconnected. Uh, that's OK. Let's switch back here uh, to QGIS, because I have one more script we can look at in QGIS, which is to load these polygons. Um, so we'll run that. Uh, and what this is going to do is go out to this Neo4j Aura instance, where I've stored uh, this data, and draw these polygons. I pulled in just one region, so we have things. This, I think, is Glacier National Park. Uh, and I have that information available in QGIS. Now, what's really powerful would be to combine the visualization, graph visualization functionality that we have in tools like Neo4j Bloom that allow us to see this parcel in the context of how it's being treated uh, in Congress, what legislators are involved, 
uh, with Glacier National Park? What other protected areas are they involved in? Um, these sorts of things help us put that, um, that into context alongside our GIS data. Cool, so I think we're about out of time. I'll leave with just a couple uh, of resources to mention if you're interested um, in learning more, working with geospatial data in Neo4j. Uh, the first I'll mention is, is Neo4j Aura. Neo4j Aura is Neo4j's hosted cloud service. It has a free tier, so I can um, spin up Neo4j and have a free instance that's always around, uh, which is great for loading data, uh, building these types of little applications uh, as we're learning. Neo4j Sandbox has uh, more uh, example data sets and guides. So for example, the Graph Data Science Airports data set, there's also a data set specific to OpenStreetMap that includes uh, Graph Data Science and some of the routing functionality uh, that we mentioned. Cool, well, that's all I have today. Um, these slides are available, dev.neo4j.com, geo-nodes2022. Um, and I'll uh, jump into the chat and see if we have any questions.